Now, I am by no means the first guy to quip that leather leadership is challenging because it's like trying to herd a bunch of cats. Others have been saying that for years, decades even. <clears throat> but while that cute clip is fun to watch, it's also a bit misleading too. To begin with, the premise is wrong. We all know that when it's cattle that are being rounded up for a cattle drive, those cows are all headed for the same place, a short stop at a slaughterhouse, and then onto somebody's plate for dinner. But just exactly where would anyone want a herd of cats to go? <laughs> I suppose that EDS, the computer services company responsible for the Super Bowl commercial you just watched, would have us believe that those cats are all being driven toward, I guess, the land of solutions. Okay, that sounds good. Companies and businesses identify their really tough IT problems and then hire some outfit like EDS to bring in cat wranglers to solve their IT problems, I get it. But if we're going to seriously compare leather leadership to herding cats toward solutions, then it stands to reason that we had better know and know very clearly exactly what our problems are before going off in search of solutions. And do we? Do we really know what our problems are? Do we know what our problems as a community are? Has anyone ever really bothered to ask our communities what its problems are? I don't remember anybody ever taking a poll to identify problems so that our leather leadership could bend its talents and efforts to finding some solutions for those problems. Nope. Never heard of anybody doing that kind of research on us. Yet lots of other kinds of minority groups have had exactly that kind of problem identification research done, including, but certainly not limited to, people of any color, religious minorities, immigrant populations, legal and otherwise, substance abusers, the homeless, the elderly, high school seniors in Florida, post-operative knee replacement patients, survivors of atomic bomb blasts, and many other groups yeah. for that matter, including even cat owners, for God's sake, <laughs> have had more research done on their problems than we have had done on ours. Why not us? Why not us? Why don't we know what our people consider their problems to be? You know, I do get various answers to that question when I've asked it. Oh, well, that kind of research is expensive and nobody has any money for it. Or, well, who do that kind of research and how? Or, well, it won't work because different places have got different problems. Or, our leaders just somehow know what our problems are. Or, my favorite. <laughs> Nobody really cares. Well, it isn't true that nobody really cares what our problems are, but what is almost certainly true is that not very damn many of our people care what our problems are. And why not? Because the main problem that concerns the vast majority of kingsters is, guess what? Getting laid. <laughs> Or I probably should have said getting well laid. <laughs> or better yet, getting laid well. <laughs> Which at base, and please God let us not forget, is exactly what spawned our communities in the first place. Anthropology, my undergraduate majors, or one of them anyway, suggests that communities are born when individuals figure out that it's easier, faster, safer, and more efficient to get one's individual needs met when one tries to do that from inside a community 
rather than trying to get your needs met as a loner from outside a community. And certainly the, the history of our own leather, erotic, subcultural world would support that idea. The renegade motorcycle culture of the late 1940s in California spawned the first gay motorcycle clubs right here in LA in the mid-1950s, which then proliferated across the nation. With a few exceptions, mostly in New York, those motorcycle clubs gave rise to our leather bars, where it then became possible to join networks of BDSM players, communities, to learn the craft of one's favorite kinks, and most importantly, to find suitable partners to get laid. So, at least for the last 45 years, the conventional wisdom has been participation in brick and mortar communities results in more and better sex. <laughs> that was then. But for years now, predictable communities with an actual street address have been eroding as more and more of us choose to spend our time in communities with a web address or even more brief flash mob type gatherings. <laughs> I refer to virtual communities which manifest themselves in what we used to call cyberspace. Now, I'm sure that no one in this room has failed to notice at least two features of the progressive virtualization of our world. First, Individuals can find as much information as they want about radical sex online. And second, individuals can seek out with great precision their own erotic counterparts without ever leaving home. Hell, it's even easy to do these things on your smartphone while you're shopping for groceries if you want to. <laughs> A Match.com commercial I saw the other day says that one in five relationships now begins online. But I'm betting that in our worlds, the great majority of our relationships begin online. Although I can't prove it, no research on us, remember? I strongly suspect that we perverts took to the online world like ducks to water long before the general population did. Just for fun, raise your hands. How many of you actually remember paying upwards of 20 bucks a month for an AOL or a CompuServe membership back in the day? Come on, raise your hand. <laughs> All free now, right? <laughs> do, do that again. That's really satisfying. <laughs> All right. That means that you are, hmm, pardon me, of a certain age. By the way. Anyway, I don't think there's much debate today that for a while now, the real gateways into the various worlds of all the radical sexualities are now found online. Which, by the way, begs the question, why are you guys even here? <laughs> After I read way too many of the class descriptions offered at this event, I kept asking myself, um, why couldn't someone who really wants that same information find it from several different sources online and save themselves the cost of hotel travel and event fees? As conference attendees, it seems to me that you have the right to expect the presenters here to restrict themselves to presenting only information and ideas that cannot be found online. And so, I therefore urge you presenters to review your class plans tonight and amend them from that point of view. Make sure that you're worth the hundreds of bucks that it's costing a lot of people to be here. 
including, much to my shock, after keynoting this event 12 years ago, the presenters themselves. I was stunned to learn that the faculty here at this event this year are still expected to pay a registration fee and pay for your own hotel room. At no other long established headline event in this country is the faculty subjected to that kind of treatment. And I need to believe that somebody has given very serious thought to how that policy, those policies, skew who is and who is not willing to work as faculty at here, what presents itself as a headline event. Or, for that matter, I guess it's up to me to ask, Why isn't this entire conference done as a group of webinars, cached video files, online real-time seminars and discussion groups that can be made easily available to anyone in any city and of course at no charge what so fucking ever. Embracing virtual event models will be far superior to doing this event the same way it's been done for the last 15 years, people, if for no other reason than that we'll lose our next generations. Look around you, we already are. 35% of the US population is under 25 years of age. Our president is committed to extend high-speed internet service to cover 98% of our nation. People, today, online social networking is rapidly becoming the infrastructure of community. If we can have that life and recon, then I'm very sure that deploying virtual event models for our educational gatherings, all of them, is possible is necessary and ultimately is inevitable. With the talent that's in this community, I am sure that this evolution just ain't rocket science. Because if clinging, if clinging, <clears throat> that's what happens when you get old people to do this. <laughs> if clinging to this current outdated event model is representative example of modern leather leadership, then only some truly revolutionary changes in our vision of how we do things can save us from ourselves. Our leadership has for too long been limited to thinking tactically, but unless we begin to think strategically, then leather life as we have known it will continue to slowly fade, much like traditional Native American tribal culture has done. And if you do not understand the distinction between the words tactical and strategic, go do some homework. 